Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, thanks again everybody for, for coming out. Uh, it's my honor to uh, introduce our final presenter of the afternoon. Um, this presenter also comes to us from the state of North, of North Carolina, uh, though not UNC. He's from Wake Forest. Actually, you might want to hitch a ride home tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> I might, yeah. yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please give a nice warm welcome for Heiko Vigors from uh, Wake Forest. Uh, thank you. So um, I'm going to talk about Low German, um, or commonly called Platt. What is Platt? So in German you have uh, in Germany you have uh, two languages: uh, Hochdeutsch (High German) or Niederdeutsch (Plattdeutsch) uh, (Low German). And Low German is spoken in Northern Germany. Um, and High German is also the standard language and is spoken everywhere but originated in Southern Germany. Um, and um, I grew up with uh, Low German. Low German is um, <clears throat> classified as a West Germanic language. It is not a dialect, it is a language. And uh, I just want to show you an example. So in High German, I would say, ich bin mit Plattdeutsch aufgewachsen und bei uns in der Nachbarschaft haben alle Platt gesprochen. In Low German, ich bin mit Plattdeutsch aufgewachsen und bei uns in der Nachbarschaft haben alle mal Platt gesprochen. Um, so that's the, that's the difference. Platt is an endangered language. Um, there are about one million active speakers left in the 21st century. There's been a massive erosion since the middle of the 20th century and it's been added to the uh, EU's list of endangered languages uh, in Europe. Um, in parts of northern Germany, uh, also where I come from, you have a diglossic situation. So that uh, means you have high German as the high variety and low German as the low variety or L variety, and you know the differences. So uh, high variety is the prestigious one, official literature is in the H variety, L variety is uh, private, sort of unsophisticated, little literature, and there's always in the term, uh, in, in terms of low German, this uh, yeah, prejudice that plot is spoken by peasants. My question was, is Low German used at the workplace? <clears throat> and um, in, or in other words, can a regional dialect, in this case Low German, serve as a professional register? Um, and these are the target areas. Uh, so you see these are the Netherlands, and then here's the Grafschaft Bentheim. This is a county, the county is called Grafschaft Bentheim. And another one is called Emsland. Um, <clears throat> but before I start with uh, the results of what I did, um, so what professional register is uh, when something that you use in formal situations, especially uh, on the job, uh, where often you use a more polished or refined uh, register. Uh, the term register is not without its problems. Um, it is a universal con concept, I think, uh, based on the fact that we don't always talk the same way at every occasion. Uh, but besides that, uh, um, it's not very well defined um, and um, that we don't really have an enough data. There are a lot of problems with it. Uh, how many different types of register are there? Is register the same, similar, completely different than style? Is it an oral phenomenon? Is there a written register? There's a lot of research about it uh, since the 60s and no real solution has been agreed upon and it's not the, my intention to actually contribute to that um, uh, discussion. But we can be fairly sure that an, a professional register is a uh, also called formal register, consultative register, it's used at the workplace a lot uh, in white collar professions. It's a more polished, refined register, avoidance of slang, um, and so on. It's almost always the age variety, almost always. 
there is a certain relation between dialect and register, um, but also a difference. Dialect is a language variety determined by the user, and register is determined by its use. Um, and then when people do combine the two, register studies and uh, dialect studies, they almost always focus on social dialect. For example, William Lavov's department store study, where he only focused on one uh, phonological aspect, and that's how they uh, pronounce R. Um, there haven't been really any studies about register variation in regional dialect. And also, uh, whenever there are studies with social dialects, uh, there's always a socioeconomic explanation. Meaning this social group speaks like this, and this social group speaks like that, and so on. And um, what I wanted to do is I'm not focusing on one particular phonological, morphological aspect. I'm talking about a dialect as a whole, and if it's used in a distinct uh, situation. Again, uh, the uh, target areas, the questionnaires, I'll come to that a little bit later. Um, so the methodology, what I did is I uh, designed questionnaires and I sent them out to 435 businesses from North Carolina to, <laughs> to Germany um, and, um, and these were unsolicited. No warning, I just sent them out. This wouldn't work here, I think, but I had a feeling that it might work there, and it did. Um, I received uh, 176 filled out questionnaires, which is a return rate of 40.5%, <coughs> which is really good. My goal was to get more than 50, and this is really good. They actually sent the questionnaires to my dad in Germany, and then he forwarded them to me. Some people actually drove to my dad's house and said, I want to make sure that you get this question. <laughs> um, and um, I try to include as many businesses as possible, hairdressers, carpentries, pharmacies, physicians, metal workers, coffee houses, kitchen designers, hotels, lawyers, everything, everybody. And there were three parts to the questionnaire. Part one was more general, um, how many employees, how many apprentices. Um, what language do you use with your clients? What language do workers use among themselves? Part two, a bit more specific. Um, and then part, so uh, can you, for example, can, do you think you can attract new customers with low German? Or would it alienate customers? And part three was, were questions about the future, and I'll come to that um, later. So this is a, um, result, <clears throat> total result, language at the workplace, just in general, only high German, 46.9%, predominant low German, 7.4%. I'm saying, I'm saying predominant because there was no single business that was only and all the time low German. Um, and then a lot was combination of low German and high German, 45.7%. Um, and um, Let's go to this one. Um, the smaller the place was, the less or the more uh, low German you, f you found was spoken. Uh, and that was, I think, that uh, was to be expected. Um, anything, the bigger places, and big is in that area, is a place with more than 15,000 um, people. That's considered pretty big. Um, but the smaller the place was, as you can see here, um, under 10,000, only 24% used only high German. Um, and that really changed exponentially. Um, <clears throat> And um, the number uh, of businesses who use either predominant low German or combination of low German and high German is actually higher than the number of businesses who use only high German. Not by much, but it is higher. Um, and here is an example, uh, the registered choice with customers. Um, and um, you can 
see that um, it's quite a bit of low German with customers and a lot of combination and uh, not so much uh, high German. Again, that changes the bigger the place is, the more high German you will hear. Um, there was also, at the end of the um, um, questionnaire, I left a page, a blank page, and I said, write any comments you want here. And almost everybody did. They all wrote comments. And those were really, really interesting. And so here are some comments about customers, uh, low German with customers. Uh, wenn Kunden Plattdeutsch sprechen, sprechen wir es auch. Wenn der Kunde Platt spricht, machen wir alles auf Platt. And they, they were a bit more careful here. Uh, we don't always speak Low German and uh, we're a bit more careful to address everybody with Low German. Uh, in a way, this is sort of an accommod accommodative act similar to what Giles uh, proposed with accommodation theory. That is a theory of convergence, only this is uh, uh, much more here because this is actual, actually a, a one-sided accommodation, uh, what uh, Macher calls demonstrativa varietatenbeck, so demonstrative change of variation. It's actually more than accommodation. People said if we speak platt with our customers, it's an icebreaker. It's just really good for the situation in general. For some, it was a necessity. It was that they have to speak low German with their customers, uh, especially older customers. They had to speak low German with them. Um, this company even asked new employees or uh, apprentices, can you speak Platt? If not, then this is going to be a problem in our company. Um, then certain professions, anything that had to do with farmers, everything was in low German. Um, that was uh, throughout. Uh, these people, this was a bank, a white collar place. And they said, we encourage our employees to speak low German. And if they can't, then we try to train them and uh, to speak more low German, which I thought was really, really cool. Uh, on the other hand, some people said, this Nordhorn is the biggest place. So this is more than 50,000 uh, people. And uh, they said that, um, that it, it, there is not much blood in their um, uh, businesses. Once they said the probability that such a constellation occurs, that is that the employee and the customer speak plat, is unusual. Can also be a generational problem. Um, a lot of people said that uh, younger customers don't speak low German or the older employees who used to speak it uh, have all passed away or that teenagers in general don't understand it anymore. Some people said it was a home field advantage, Heim Vorteil, uh, to speak it with customers. And there were maybe also some um, material aspects involved in that. Um, with business partners, it was different. As you can see, uh, High German dominates, um, especially in the Emsland. Um, and the reasons for that is, well, often the business partners are from other parts of Germany, sometimes even other countries. Low German doesn't really have a standard orthography. Everything official, contracts and so on, um, have to be in high German. And often there are also technical terms where there is no word for that in low German. Very interesting was the white collar professions and the results there. So. Uh, this quote that you see here by Vira, Vira is actually a uh, linguist of in Low German, and even he said that you only find it mostly in agriculture. Um, and, and that wasn't just true in my uh, survey. This was a bank, and they said that they even speak about uh, financing and um, money investments or refinancing a house. Everything's done in Logan, uh, which was really surprising. 
In the health industry also, this uh, doctor said, um, I prefer to speak low German because uh, my patients feel and cuss in low German. <laughs> and this particular doctor was from the Netherlands. Uh, this was a nurse from uh, the regional hospital and he was talking about the operating room, the OP Raum, and even there he said that they often speak uh, low German with the patients. So be just before they get the needle or whenever, whatever they get, they speak low German with them. And that helps. Then in the future, um, register choice with apprentices. So apprentices are usually between 16 and 19 years old. And you can see that high German is dominates, 100% even. Predominant low German, zero. A mix, sometimes, not much. By population, even then it doesn't change. Even the smaller places, it's mostly um, high German. Well, there's a mix here, 28 or 17 percent, but for the most part, it's um, high German. And then there was a question I asked, it was on the <coughs> questionnaires. We speak much more, more unchanged, less, much less low German in our business than 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, the answer was uh, more than 85 percent said less. How much low German will probably be spoken at your business in 10 to 15 years? 98% said less, much less, or none. One fifth said none. Um, and um, so this, this doesn't look uh, good for the language in, in general. Um, and then this is a comparison, uh, a, a disclaimer. So uh, there were a lot of uh, companies uh, who did not reply. And had they replied, then the results might look different, maybe not so favorable. And also, I'm relying on self-evaluation. And I can't prove, really, if this is true or not. But still, if you compare these results to Möller's survey from 2007, Möller did a similar survey, but he only asked one question, <clears throat> is low German used at uh, the workplace? And he uh, asked companies all over northern Germany. And um, if you compare my results with Möller's results, you see that the, my target areas are way above the uh, national average or the northern German average. Um, so that's, I, I think that's a pretty good sign though. Um, conclusion, so um, first of all, I think that regional dialect and professional register are compatible, definitely. And also very important that the L variety can serve as a means of communication at the modern day workplace. It doesn't have to be the H variety. And that's especially true in white collar professions. And I think that in general it calls for reevaluation that the L variety just can't hack it and you just speak it at home and that's it. Um, and uh, the interesting also, um, this, I don't think my survey had anything to do with the socioeconomic status of uh, businesses or the, re the, the uh, people who responded. Um, that might be the case for social dialects, but for regional dialects, that really doesn't play a role or very little role. And then maybe most importantly, community matters. <clears throat> Um, the high results or the high use of low German um, must be seen by taking into account a community's sociogenesis. And that's something that most linguists don't do. And you have to look at the community as a whole, really, to understand it. You have to understand the linguistic culture uh, of that uh, community. Um, and really only a few um, 
linguists are actually doing that. Um, and you have to yeah, take into account the local intra and interpersonal processes of the community um, and also that uh, the tra transmission of culture is still a local one. Um, can I do I have one more minute? Okay. Um, that's basically the end of uh, this talk. I just wanted to add um, this, these past two days, um, I've heard so much about language revitalization, um, where there are languages and there's only a handful of speakers left. Or you have to reconstruct the language. Now, Platt isn't there yet. It isn't. But in 100 or 150 years from now, we might be there. It, it doesn't look good. It really doesn't. But still, Bedankt für Tohren. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Thank you for your talk. I, I, I think um, the work that you're doing and the work that I'm doing have a, a mm -hmm. much in common. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't clear. I mean, you said the orthography is not fixed. Yeah, no. Uh, but um, it, going back to the concept of linguistic landscapes, are there signs like in town in small yes in yes Britain? so uh, yes just recently in my hometown they changed the street signs uh, so they're bilingual street signs now there have been attempts to have a common orthography mm -hmm. but you run into uh, these problems that low German is not homogenous mm -hmm. so 15 kilometers away they already speak a different variety mm -hmm. and you can't produce uh, a common orthography that satisfies all of these varieties. Mm -hmm. That's really difficult. Well, and then a quick follow-up. I think one of the things that I've found in the community, the, the communities that I've been looking at, and what I've been told from members of the community, is education in early yeah. childhood. <clears throat> yeah. Is, yeah. is um, black taught in school? Yeah. Yeah. There are some. Uh, there are attempts to uh, do that. Uh, to have. Um, teach that in elementary school at least one hour a week. Mm -hmm. Officially, they're not allowed to, they're doing it anyway. Um, yeah, and the nice thing is that they have a living link, most of them, so the kids can go home to a grandfather and say, hey, I just learned this and this in Platt, and then they can answer, oh, yeah, this is cool, do you know what this is in Platt? Uh, so that, as long as the living link is still there, mm -hmm. and it's really important. Yeah, and they also have reading competitions in Platt and things oh, like wonderful. that. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's that's, quite nice. That's really cool. And that, that's really supported by the local authorities too, and by local businesses a lot. It yeah. sounds like there are people that are passionate about it still. They care, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the reason why I got so many returns was because people care. Mm -hmm. They really care about it. And they're afraid too that they... I don't want to hog on. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, that, that was a really interesting study. Uh, yes. I was... In, Thanks for not doing the old socioeconomic status thing, you know. Yeah, but yeah. yeah. That's, that's been done. Yeah. Um, but, but not. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's I, I, I was wondering <laughs> if you uh, like consider. Um, uh, I mean, maybe you're familiar with like no Roy social networks mm -hmm. uh, yeah. or you know, yeah. communities of practice these kind of theories. Yeah. Um, just as, a, and I would hate to replicate those methods, uh, but I mean, maybe if you could do it online or something. Mm -hmm. Although maybe the elderly, I, I don't know. But if you could sort of replicate your methods and ask your dad to send the mail again or something like that, mm -hmm. um, it might be interesting to just look at, uh, so how do these individuals communicate, not just in the binary relationships of worker to customer or worker with worker, mm -hmm. um, but just in a more wide-ranging sort of uh, way. So how yeah. do farmers communicate not only with other farmers, but what do they do when they go to the store? Yeah. Um, and what happens in the larger city, or yeah. even more interestingly, the fringe cities that are sort of on the outer edges of that, where they're in closer contact with yeah. the other, with high German, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, I feel like there's, there's a lot that can be done with what you've kind of already Definitely, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, that, that those are good suggestions, definitely. Uh, it's 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 such a big undertaking to do such a study. I, yeah, yeah. Uh, but those that's a definitely a good. Do you think um, that you would have enough speakers that might have? Uh, I mean, is there, I don't know, like a Facebook group or something, or is the population developed for that? 
Mostly, yeah, I think so. And there's also a sort of, mm, they don't necessarily believe that the internet serves them well, right, right. Uh, because everything is either in high German or in English, um, and so they kind of shun that anyway. Yeah, so the mail survey. Yeah. Wow, that's, yeah. I respect you for doing that. <laughs> I was given up. I would have yeah. <laughs> I mean, international mail, you know, what's the postage? You got yeah, to yeah. exchange. It was so much. Yes. Yeah. Yes, please. So, throughout your questions, you had three categories. Uh -huh. Basically, uh, high German, only low German, and then the third category was mixed. Yeah. Can you further explicate what you mean by mixed there? Are you mean mixed relative to different constituencies? Uh, speak to, to farmers one way, <clears throat> speak to others another way. That mix by mixed, uh, I meant that with some, uh, especially with customers, with some customers, they speak high German, and those who prefer it, they speak low German. Uh, but it's not based on um, any kind of um, social group or a specific professional group. Uh, by mixed, I just meant that. Um, they can they can do both, and they usually do both, depending on what the customer wants. Okay, so yeah. Actually, but one could argue that uh, that some of that category could be dispersed into the other two categories. Yes, definitely. So if they, if yeah. They, if the customer wants mm -hmm. low German, mm -hmm. up, yeah. And that could, in principle, be going to the low German category. Yeah. That would that would beef up your statistics. So I, I don't you know for me to say that it's <coughs> mixed. Would mean something slightly different, I think. By what I know that the, the difficulty is when you send a questionnaire to people, and it takes. It looks like it's going to take more than 20 minutes to fill this out, or it's going to look really complicated. They're not going to do this. Uh, so and and also no jargon, right? So you you have to keep it simple. And interesting for them, for the, uh, the people who fill it out, that they say, oh, I'm cool, fill, I'm filling out a questionnaire. That, that's what you want. And uh, if I add that question, which is a good question, it would complicate things. And I, I wouldn't get as many returns, unfortunately. Right, but it also would make me think right off the bat that the rate of, uh, of a plot being spoken is considerably higher than what you're suggesting. It, that, that, that would be great. It's, yeah, it's definitely possible. Yeah. Then again, if you factor in those companies who didn't reply, to whom plot might be irrelevant, it, it might drop again. But it's a good thought, and one would hope it would be higher than that. If, um, Oh, no, no, no. I've done something. Okay. I, I was just wondering. So, yeah. so I noticed that the orthography and pronunciations are uh, very similar to Dutch and it's, yeah, spoken, yeah. it's spoken on the border. Yeah. Are there many native speakers who find themselves in the political boundary of the Netherlands? Yes. This is actually a triglossia, if you want to, with two H varieties Dutch and uh, High German and uh, Low German. And the interesting thing was. Uh, on the comment page, at least 10 companies wrote that when, when uh, Dutch people, when Dutch customers come, and they frequently do, uh, they speak low German with them, even though I didn't even ask about that. But they wanted to point that out. Yeah, we speak, we speak low German with the Dutch. Um, but the further you go into uh, the Netherlands, once you're out of the streektal, uh, the less they understand. So if you go to Amsterdam and you speak low German, they won't understand. It's not going to work. Okay. Yeah. But, yeah. I, I, I'm sorry, a moment and then, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, to study on Garibasi and all this. Yeah. Um, Arabic, German, Asian, Chinese, 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 Going away from the center all this. Yeah, yeah. Um, but from uh, the beginning of your talk, you said there are two different languages. Yes. So they, they uh, <clears throat> Low German derived from, uh, historically, from Old Saxon, 
which is a different language. Um, and so they, they don't do, I mean, it's related to, to high German, but uh, they don't really go back to a common source. Well, ultimately, yes, but um, it's not that uh, low German derived from high German. That's not the case. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Thank you. And I really want to tell you this because I think it might, um, it may seem like a ludicrous idea. And I just thought of it. Um, but one of the things that's really helped uh, the presence of Bella Gitchi on the internet is uh, in a, about 2000, a woman uh, who was from the culture, Bella Gitchi culture, but she was in gone to school and was living in New York City, decided to come back and she. Um, got some contingent people together and uh, became the um, somewhat, and it's, she's a very controversial figure, the self-anointed queen of the Gullah Geechee tribe. Her name is her name is Marquetta Goodwine, but she calls herself Queen Quilt. And she has become the ambassador of propagating Gullah Geechee. And she goes and gives talks, and she, she has a face, face, Facebook post. And she's a, she's a charismatic figure. She goes to elementary schools, and so I know, um, you know there's this, the the center class and, and Schwarze I mean, they're very charismatic figures that ch that children respond to. Mm -hmm. So it occurs to me, if you have a, an incredibly zealous person, yeah. you could adopt a persona yeah. to to make um, to, to make a plot. Um, a cool thing, a fun yeah, thing, yeah. something that the kids are interested mm -hmm. in that will carry yeah. over. Because you need um, media. I'm sorry? Because you need media. You, that, you that need like media, media. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> you get, she, she gets in the te on TV, mm -hmm. she gets, she spoke at the UN on behalf of the Gullah Geechee people. So um, her, her, her self promotion initially has become really incredibly mm -hmm. powerful. She, yes. she helped get the Gullah Geechee care corridor established. So, just as, like a, that. As, a, as a quick answer, uh, uh, there's now um, a low German hip hop band. Yeah. There you go. They're called 50 Pence, which is German or for 50 cents, so they're named after the, the <laughs> rapper. And, uh, and, and, and that's, yeah, yeah, that's what's happening. You get those on YouTube and you yeah, yeah, get some yeah. hits and I'll then you send get some you the sponsors. link. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it can, it can. Pence. I don't think, I'm not willing really to write dry plot off yet. <clears throat> no. So we'll, we'll so finish thank on you very up. much. Oh. Yes, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Trevor is going to say a few closing remarks. Um, okay, I'll try to make this brief. I know we're all we're all itching to get out of this room. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank all of our uh, attendees today. Thanks for sticking it out. Um, I would also like to thank all of our speakers. Thank you for coming. Thank you for giving these wonderful talks. Um, thank you again to our plenary speakers um, for taking your time out of your busy schedules to come and give us your talks as well. Um, uh, firstly, tomorrow we will be in the same room. Um, we'll start again at 8.30 with um, more uh, coffee and bagels and that kind of thing. Um, beginning talks then at 9. Um, if you would like a t-shirt, um, we have those interest forms again in your folders. It's also on our website. In addition to that, we have a brief survey on our website. Um, if you have anything you think we should improve on, um, if you'd like to fill that out, we'd be uh, more than appreciative of that. Um, okay. uh, lastly, if you need receipts for your university, please contact me and we'll get those uh, uh, written up for you. And after this, directly after this, from 6.15 to 6.30ish, um, we are meeting at Transmetropolitan. It's a pizza restaurant bar. Um, it's just downtown. Um, you'll notice it's on the uh, list of restaurants on the back of your flyers. Um, so if you need directions, um, we'll all be moving en masse up there. Um, but if you'd like to, we'd love to continue discussing linguistics over drinks. And, uh, and we'll be going upstairs, probably. There's more space upstairs, right, Trevor? Yeah. Because if you walk into the place, you wouldn't know there's an upstairs. you got to kind of look for it. So. But that concludes our second day. Thank you all for coming. Yeah. 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 Yeah.